The ninth video on roots and polynomials looks at right half plane factors or roots. So this series of videos is focused on how we might solve for the roots of a polynomial and the previous few moved us on to looking at pole and zero locations. So when you might have a transfer function and you're interested in the roots of the numerator and the denominator. Now a key thing that comes across in systems analysis is the position of the poles. Are they in the left half plane or the right half plane? And so this video is going to look at in particular how do we identify where the roots are and why is that important? So first a bit of background. If we look at some common Laplace transforms and we've put down here and the corresponding signals you see a very clear pattern. 1 over s plus a gives you a decaying exponential. It converges. 1 over s minus b gives you an exponential which diverges to infinity. Here's a different one. 1 over s plus a times s plus c will give you two exponentials. I'm not too worried about what the residues capital A and capital B are, but these are both convergent. So you see the s plus a and the s plus c correspond to convergent exponentials. What about 1 over s plus a s minus b? And here you see when you do the inverse Laplace you get a convergent exponential corresponding to the s plus a but a divergent exponential corresponding to the s minus b. Now I've put in some quadratic denominators which have complex roots so you'll see here we've got the denominator written as s squared plus 2as plus a squared plus omega squared and this gives us a time domain signal like this e to the minus at a cos plus b sine and again you'll notice because we've got the exponential e to the minus at this is convergent. However, what if we choose something whose denominator is a bit like this s squared minus 2bs plus b squared plus omega squared and now you notice we get an e to the plus bt which is a convergent signal. So what do we notice from all of this? If we have simple factors then factors of the form s plus a give us convergent solutions. However, if we have something like s minus b we get divergent solutions. So for simple factors s plus a is good, s minus b is bad. What about quadratic factors? Well I've given lots of them here so you can see. If I have s plus a times s plus b and I multiply it out you get this s squared plus a plus b s plus a b. You'll see lots of positives wherever you go. That's good. That's convergent. If I have something like s plus a times s minus b and I multiply that out you see what we've got here. We've got an s squared plus a minus b s minus a b and what's the key thing here you'll see a negative coefficient in our quadratic and that tells us that we've got a divergent signal in here which corresponds to the s minus b. What if I've got an s minus a s minus b? You'll notice now I get a negative coefficient here because that negative coefficient I know I've got divergent signals. What about this sort of quadratic with complex roots s plus a plus j omega s plus a minus j omega which you remember corresponded to the sinusoidal decay with an e to the minus at. You'll notice again all the coefficients are positive. So if I use a different colour all the coefficients are positive here, all the coefficients are positive here and both of those corresponded to convergent signals. However, if I go to the one at the bottom, s minus b plus j omega, s minus b minus j omega, what do you notice again? A negative coefficient, divergent. So wherever we had negative coefficients, which I've marked here, here and here, it corresponded to a divergent signal. So what's the summary? If we saw a negative coefficient in our polynomial, so an s minus b or an s squared minus ds plus e or an s squared minus ds minus e or an s squared plus ds minus e, you notice all of those have got one or two negative coefficients, then those denominator factors are associated with divergent signals. 
to a conclusion, if after we've done a complete factorization of the denominator into first and second order forms, if any of those factors contain a negative coefficient, then the inverse Laplace includes a corresponding divergent component. So we need to avoid negative coefficients in the single factors and quadratic factors if we want the signal to be convergent. So here's a typical question. Which of the following Laplace transforms are associated with a convergent signal? First of all, y, 3 over s plus 4. That one's easy. We're happy. What about the next one, z? You'll notice in the denominator I've gone s minus 0 0.02. So that one gives me a diverge, divergent signal. Next, look at m. Now, there's a bit of a catch here. The only polynomial that really matters, and I'll write it here, is the denominator. The numerator makes no difference to the assessment of stability. So even though m has got this 2s minus 1 in the numerator, that's actually irrelevant to the stability. So all I'm looking at is the denominator, and therefore m of s is convergent because I've got an s squared plus 0.1s plus 0.3. Similarly, if I look at n, you'll see although it's got a minus 3 in the numerator, it's only the denominator I care about. It's got s plus 0.04, so that corresponds to a convergent signal. Conversely, I look at k, look at the denominator, and what do I see? I see an s minus 20. So that one corresponds to a divergent signal. If I look at a, and I look at the denominator, I see an s squared minus 0.1 again. We see that minus sign corresponds to a divergent signal. I look at b, and I can see there's two negative coefficients in the denominator. s squared minus 1s minus 3 corresponds to a divergent signal. And finally, I look at c. I see the denominator's got all positive coefficients. It's a quadratic, corresponds to a convergent signal. What will you do then if you're given a higher order polynomial in non-factorized forms? That's the key thing. It's not been factorized. So you say, well, I can do it easily if you give me first order forms and second order forms. But what if it's third or fourth order or something else? How do I work out the answer then? So here's the solution. If the factorization is not obvious, using the methods that we gave you in the earlier videos in this series, you're going to have to use a computer to factorize rather than spending time doing this by hand. So i.e. just work out the roots explicitly and then you'll know whether they correspond to a convergent or a divergent signal. Alternatively, you might try using the Routher way. Now, I should emphasize, the Routher way is somewhat superseded these days by computers. When the Routher way was popular, there was no computing, and it was the only way or the most effective way to do things. However, the Routher way still is useful because it helps you to spot the obvious. It gives you insight without doing much computation. So we're going to summarize a key part of the Routher way next, the bit that is useful and that avoids heavy computation. So what we're going to do is just going to look at the Routh array for third order polynomials. We're not going to go higher because when you go to fourth order, the algebra very quickly gets quite messy. So here's my third order polynomial. It's P. And I want to know, has P got any roots in the right half plane? Because if it's got a root in the right half plane and this P corresponds to a denominator of a Lelapass transform, I've got a divergent signal. Now here's the answer from the Routh array. P of S has all its roots in the left half plane if and only if AD is less than BC. A very, very simple formula. You're looking at the coefficients of this polynomial. You're multiplying together the two central ones, that's B and C, and you're comparing them to the two outer ones, that's A and D. And as long as BC is greater than AD, all your roots are in the left half plane. And conversely, obviously, if AD was bigger than BC, you must have at least one right half plane root. So we'll do, show some examples to illustrate this. We've just reminded you of the result at the top, in case you forget it. So here's a polynomial. Now you'll notice I've written it in factorized form just so you can check what's happening. It's s plus 1 times s plus 2 times s plus 3. 
When I multiply it out, you get this. s cubed plus 6s squared plus 11s plus 6. Now remember, in this particular case, the coefficient a equals 1, b equals 6, c equals 11, d equals 6. So if I put that into this formula we've set up here. We're checking bc is greater than ad. We get 6 times 11 greater than 6, which it is. So all left half plane because our criteria has been satisfied. Here's the second example. And you'll notice in this particular case, I've deliberately inserted a right half plane root. You'll notice the s minus 2. When I multiply that out, I get s cubed plus 2s squared minus 5s minus 6. So again, let's write out the coefficients. a equals 1, b equals 2, c equals minus 5, d equals minus 6. And now plug those into our formula bc greater than ad. So bc is 2 times minus 5, which is minus 10, and that's clearly less than minus 6. So we haven't satisfied our criteria at the top. bc is not greater than ad, so you must have a right half plane root, which we knew because we set it up that way, but we're demonstrating that this Routh criteria works. Next example then. You'll notice I've set one up, which you can look at written as a quadratic form times a simple factor. And you'll say, yes, I know all those roots are in the left half plane from what we've done earlier. But let's just confirm it with a Routh array. So I multiply it out. There it is, s cubed plus 5s squared plus 10s plus 12. I write a equals 1, b equals 5, c equals 10, d equals 12. Plug the numbers in. And I get 5 times 10, that's the BC, is greater than 12, which is A times D. So these are all in the left half plane. The Routh array has confirmed it. And a final example. Again, you'll see I've set it up so it has got some right half plane roots. But the interesting thing here is if you look at the polynomial when it's multiplied out, you'll notice all the coefficients are positive. S cubed plus 0.8 S squared plus 3.8s plus 4. And you look at that and you say, well, all the coefficients are positive. I might expect all the roots to be in the left half plane. But when you use the Routh array, you find b times c, 0.8 times 3.8, is less than ad4. And therefore, this includes right half plane roots. So that's a key thing for you. With cubics, you can't just look at the sign of the coefficients. You have to use something like the Routh array to be sure to get it correct. So here's some examples for us to try. Which of these have got only left half plane roots? So I'm just going to use this formula, BC greater than AD, and <coughs> write things down. So in this case, BC equals 6 times 15, which is 90. AD equals 8. Clearly, BC is bigger than AD, so this one is good. What about the next one? I can see a negative coefficient and a negative coefficient, so this one is bad. I don't need to use the Routh array. As soon as I see negative coefficients, I know there must be at least one right half plane factor. Next one. BC equals 4, see 2 times 2. AD equals 5, and in this case, AD is bigger than BC, so this one must include a right half plane factor. And you'll see how easy that computation was. <laughs> and again, you'll see all positive coefficients, and yet it includes a right half plane factor. Next one, BC 4 times 10. Better write that BC equals. AD equals 32. BC bigger than AD. We're OK. Next one, you see a negative coefficient. And therefore, without any further computation, I know it must include a right half plane root. And the final one, we've got BC equals 2. That's 10 times 0 0.2. AD equals 4. So again, AD is bigger than BC. So this must include a right half plane root. So conclusions. We presented some simple rules for identifying when a polynomial has at least one right half plane root. And we've noted 
that if the denominator of a Laplace transform includes a right half plane root, then the associated signal is divergent, and that's why this observation is so important. So therefore, real systems require all the roots of the denominator to be in the left half plane if we're going to get desirable behavior. Now, just as a warning, for convenience in this video, we always made sure that the coefficient of the maximum power was unity plus one. If this not, is not the case, please be careful um, and make sure you check your working through carefully with everything we've done.